karaoke books. The Confessions. St. Augustine of Hippo. Translated by Joseph Green Pilkington. Audiobook. Book 1. Chapter 1. He proclaims the greatness of God, whom he desires to seek and invoke, being awakened by him. 1. Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power, and of thy wisdom there is no end. And man, being a part of thy creation, desires to praise thee, man, who bears about with him his mortality, the witness of his sin, even the witness that thou, resistest the proud, yet man, this part of thy creation, desires to praise thee. Thou movest us to delight in praising thee, for thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in thee. Lord, teach me to know and understand which of these should be first, to call on thee, or to praise thee, and likewise to know thee, or to call upon thee. But who is there that calls upon thee without knowing thee? For he that knows thee not may call upon thee as other than thou art. Or perhaps we call on thee that we may know thee. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe without a preacher? And those who seek the Lord shall praise him. For those who seek shall find him, and those who find him shall praise him. Let me seek thee, Lord, in calling on thee, and call on thee in believing in thee. For thou hast been preached unto us. O Lord, my faith calls on thee, that faith which thou hast imparted to me, which thou hast breathed into me through the incarnation of thy Son, through the ministry of thy preacher. Chapter 2. That the God whom we invoke is in us, and we in him. 2. And how shall I call upon my God, my God and my Lord? For when I call on him I ask him to come into me. And what place is there in me into which my God can come, into which God can come, even he who made heaven and earth? Is there anything in me, O Lord my God, that can contain thee? Do indeed the very heaven and the earth, which thou hast made, and in which thou hast made me, contain thee? Or, as nothing could exist without thee, doth whatever exists contain thee? Why, then, do I ask thee to come into me, since I indeed exist, and could not exist if thou wert not in me? Because I am not yet in hell, though thou art even there, for, if I go down into hell thou art there. I could not therefore exist, could not exist at all, O my God, unless thou wert in me. Or should I not rather say, that I could not exist unless I were in thee from whom are all things, by whom are all things, in whom are all things? Even so, Lord, even so. Where do I call thee to, since thou art in me, or whence canst thou come into me? For where outside heaven and earth can I go that from thence my God may come into me who has said, I fill heaven and earth? Chapter 3 Everywhere God wholly filleth all things, but neither heaven nor earth containeth him. 3. Since, then, thou fillest heaven and earth, do they contain thee? Or, as they contain thee not, dost thou fill them, and yet there remains something over? And where dost thou pour forth that which remaineth of thee when the heaven and earth are filled? Or, indeed, is there no need that thou who containest all things shouldest be contained of any? since those things which thou fillest thou fillest by containing them. For the vessels which thou fillest do not sustain thee, since should they even be broken thou wilt not be poured forth. And when thou art poured forth on us, thou art not cast down, but we are uplifted, nor art thou dissipated, but we are drawn together. But, as thou fillest all things, dost thou fill them with thy whole self, or, as even all things cannot altogether contain thee, do they contain a part, and do all at once contain the same part? Or has each its own proper part, the greater more, the smaller less? Is, then, one part of thee greater, another less? Or is it that thou art holy everywhere whilst nothing altogether contains thee? Chapter 4. The majesty of God is supreme, and his virtues inexplicable. 4. What, then, art thou, O my God, what, I ask, but the Lord God? For who is Lord but the Lord? Or who is God save our God? 
most high, most excellent, most potent, most omnipotent, most piteous and most just, most hidden and most near, most beauteous and most strong, stable, yet contained of none, unchangeable, yet changing all things, never new, never old, making all things new, yet bringing old age upon the proud and they know it not, always working, yet ever at rest, gathering, yet needing nothing, sustaining, pervading, and protecting, creating, nourishing, and developing, seeking, and yet possessing all things. Thou lovest, and burnest not, art jealous, yet free from care, repentest, and hast no sorrow, art angry, yet serene, chongest thy ways, leaving unchanged thy plans, recoverest what thou findest, having yet never lost, art never in want, whilst thou rejoicest in gain, never covetous, though requiring usury, that thou mayest owe, more than enough is given to thee, yet who hath anything that is not thine? Thou payest debts while owing nothing, and when thou forgivest debts, lossest nothing. Yet, O oh my God, my life, my holy joy, what is this that I have said? And what saith any man when he speaks of thee? Yet woe to them that keep silence, seeing that even they who say most are as the dumb. Chapter 5. He seeks rest in God, and pardon of his sins. 5. Oh! How shall I find rest in thee? Who will send thee into my heart to inebriate it, so that I may forget my woes, and embrace thee my only good? What art thou to me? Have compassion on me, that I may speak. What am I to thee that thou demandest my love, and unless I give it thee art angry, and threat a nest me with great sorrows? Is it, then, a light sorrow not to love thee? Alas! Alas! Tell me of thy compassion, O Lord my God, what thou art to me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. So speak that I may hear. Behold, Lord, the ears of my heart are before thee. Open thou them, and, say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. When I hear, may I run and lay hold on thee. Hide not thy face from me. Let me die, lest I die, if only I may see thy face. 6. Cramped is the dwelling of my soul. Do thou expand it, that thou mayest enter in. It is in ruins, restore thou it. There is that about it which must offend thine eyes. I confess and know it, but who will cleanse it? Or to whom shall I cry but to thee? Cleanse me from my secret sins, O Lord, and keep thy servant from those of other men. I believe, and therefore do I speak, Lord, thou knowest. Have I not confessed my transgressions unto thee, O my God, and thou hast put away the iniquity of my heart? I do not contend in judgment with thee, who art the truth, and I would not deceive myself, lest my iniquity lie against itself. I do not, therefore, contend in judgment with thee, for if thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Chapter 6 he describes his infancy, and lauds the protection and eternal providence of God. 7. Still suffer me to speak before thy mercy, me, dust and ashes. Suffer me to speak, for, behold, it is thy mercy I address, and not derisive man. Yet perhaps even thou daredest me, but when thou art turned to me thou wilt have compassion on me. For what do I wish to say, O Lord my God? but that I know not whence I came hither into this, shall I call it dying life or living death? Yet, as I have heard from my parents, from whose substance thou didst form me, for I myself cannot remember it, thy merciful comforts sustained me. Thus it was that the comforts of a woman's milk entertained me, for neither my mother nor my nurses filled their own breasts, but thou by them didst give me the nourishment of infancy according to thy ordinance and that bounty of thine which underlieth all things. For thou didst cause me not to want more than thou gavest, and those who nourished me willingly to give me what thou gavest them. For they, by an instinctive affection, were anxious to give me what thou hadst abundantly supplied. It was, in truth, good for them that my good should come from them, though, indeed, it was not from them, but by them. For from thee, 
O God, are all good things, and from my God is all my safety. This is what I have since discovered, as thou hast declared thyself to me by the blessings both within me and without me which thou hast bestowed upon me. For at that time I knew how to suck, to be satisfied when comfortable, and to cry when in pain, nothing beyond. 8. Afterwards I began to laugh, at first in sleep, then when waking. For this I have heard mentioned of myself, and I believe it, though I cannot remember it, for we see the same in other infants. And now little by little I realized where I was, and wished to tell my wishes to those who might satisfy them, but I could not. For my wants were within me, while they were without, and could not by any faculty of theirs enter into my soul. So I cast about limbs and voice, making the few and feeble signs I could, like, though indeed not much like, unto what I wished. And when I was not satisfied, either not being understood, or because it would have been injurious to me, I grew indignant that my elders were not subject unto me, and that those on whom I had no claim did not wait on me, and avenged myself on them by tears. That infants are such I have been able to learn by watching them, and they, though unknowing, have better shown me that I was such an one than my nurses who knew it. 9. And, behold, my infancy died long ago, and I lived. But thou, O Lord, whoever livest, and in whom nothing dies, since before the world was, and indeed before all that can be called, before, thou existest, and art the God and Lord of all thy creatures, and with thee fixedly abide the causes of all unstable things, the unchanging sources of all things changeable, and the eternal reasons of all things unreasoning and temporal. Tell me, thy suppliant, O God. Tell, O merciful one, thy miserable servant. Tell me whether my infancy succeeded another age of mine which had at that time perished. Was it that which I passed in my mother's womb? For of that something has been made known to me, and I have myself seen women with child. And what, O oh God, my joy, preceded that life? Was I, indeed, anywhere, or anybody? For no one can tell me these things, neither father nor mother, nor the experience of others, nor my own memory. Don't thou laugh at me for asking such things, and command me to praise and confess thee for what I know? 10. I give thanks to thee, Lord of heaven and earth, giving praise to thee for that my first being an infancy, of which I have no memory. For thou hast granted to man that from others he should come to conclusions as to himself, and that he should believe many things concerning himself on the authority of feeble women. Even then I had life and being, and as my infancy closed I was already seeking for signs by which my feelings might be made known to others. Whence could such a creature come but from thee, O Lord? Or shall any man be skillful enough to fashion himself? Or is there any other vein by which being and life runs into us save this, that, thou, O Lord, hast made us, with whom being and life are one, because thou thyself art being and life in the highest? Thou art the highest, thou chongest not, neither in thee doth this present day come to an end, though it doth end in thee, since in thee all such things are, for they would have no way of passing away unless thou sustain street them. And since thy years shall have no end, thy years are an ever-present day. And how many of ours and our father's days have passed through this thy day, and received from it their measure and fashion of being, and others yet to come shall so receive and pass away. But thou art the same, and all the things of tomorrow and the days yet to come, and all of yesterday and the days that are past, thou wilt do today, thou hast done today. What is it to me if any understand not? Let him still rejoice and say, What is this? Let him rejoice even so, and rather love to discover in failing to discover, than in discovering not to discover thee. Chapter 7. He shows by example that even infancy is prone to sin. 11. Hearken, O God! Alas for the sins of men! Man saith this, and thou dost compassionate him. For thou didst create him, but didst not create the sin that is in him. Who bringeth to my remembrance the sin of my infancy? For before thee none is free from sin, not even the infant which has lived but a day upon the earth. 
Who bringeth this to my remembrance? Doth not each little one, in whom I behold that which I do not remember of myself? In what, then, did I sin? Is it that I cried for the breast? If I should now so cry, not indeed for the breast, but for the food suitable to my years, I should be most justly laughed at and rebuked. What I then did deserved rebuke, but as I could not understand those who rebuked me, neither custom nor reason suffered me to be rebuked. For as we grow we root out and cast from us such habits. I have not seen any one who is wise, when, purging, anything cast away the good. Or was it good, even for a time, to strive to get by crying that which, if given, would be hurtful, to be bitterly indignant that those who were free and its elders, and those to whom it owed its being, besides many others wiser than it, who would not give way to the nod of its good pleasure, were not subject unto it, to endeavor to harm, by struggling as much as it could, because those commands were not obeyed which only could have been obeyed to its hurt. Then, in the weakness of the infant's limbs, and not in its will, lies its innocency. I myself have seen and known an infant to be jealous though it could not speak. It became pale, and cast bitter looks on its foster brother. Who is ignorant of this? Mothers and nurses tell us that they appease these things by I know not what remedies. And may this be taken for innocence, that when the fountain of milk is flowing fresh and abundant, one who has need should not be allowed to share it, though needing that nourishment to sustain life? Yet we look leniently on these things, not because they are not faults, nor because the faults are small, but because they will vanish as age increases. For although you may allow these things now, you could not bear them with equanimity if found in an older person. 12. Thou, therefore, O Lord my God, who gavest life to the infant, and a frame which, as we see, thou hast endowed with senses, compacted with limbs, beautified with form, and, for its general good and safety, hast introduced all vital energies. Thou commandest me to praise thee for these things, to give thanks unto the Lord, and to sing praise unto thy name, O Most High. For thou art a God omnipotent and good, though thou hadst done naught but these things, which none other can do but thou, who alone maddest all things, O thou most fair, who maddest all things fair, and orderest all according to thy law. This period, then, of my life, O Lord, of which I have no remembrance, which I believe on the word of others, and which I guess from other infants, it chagrins me, true though the guess be, to reckon in this life of mine which I lead in this world, and as much as, in the darkness of my forgetfulness, it is like to that which I passed in my mother's womb. But if, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, where, I pray thee, O my God, where, Lord, or when was I, thy servant, innocent? But behold, I pass by that time, for what have I to do with that, the memories of which I cannot recall? Chapter 8 that when a boy he learned to speak, not by any set method, but from the acts and words of his parents. 13. Did I not, then, growing out of the state of infancy, come to boyhood, or rather did it not come to me, and succeed to infancy? Nor did my infancy depart, for whither went it, and yet it did no longer abide, for I was no longer an infant that could not speak, but a chattering boy. I remember this, and I afterwards observed how I first learned to speak, for my elders did not teach me words in any set method, as they did letters afterwards, but myself, when I was unable to say all I wished and to whomsoever I desired, by means of the whimperings and broken utterances and various motions of my limbs, which I used to enforce my wishes, repeated the sounds in my memory by the mind, O oh my God, which thou gavest me. When they called anything by name, and moved the body towards it while they spoke, I saw and gathered that the thing they wished to point out was called by the name they then uttered, and that they did mean this was made plain by the motion of the body, even by the natural language of all nations expressed by the countenance, glance of the eye, movement of other members, and by the sound of the voice indicating the affections of the mind, as it seeks, possesses, rejects, or avoids. 
So it was that by frequently hearing words, in duly placed sentences, I gradually gathered what things they were the signs of, and having formed my mouth to the utterance of these signs, I thereby expressed my will. Thus I exchanged with those about me the signs by which we express our wishes, and advanced deeper into the stormy fellowship of human life, depending the while on the authority of parents, and the beck of elders. Chapter 9. Concerning the hatred of learning, the love of play, and the fear of being whipped noticeable in boys, and of the folly of our elders and masters. 14. O oh my God! What miseries and mockeries did I then experience, when obedience to my teachers was set before me as proper to my boyhood, that I might flourish in this world, and distinguish myself in the science of speech, which should get me honor amongst men, and deceitful riches. After that I was put to school to get learning, of which I, worthless as I was, knew not what use there was, and yet, if slow to learn, I was flogged. For this was deemed praiseworthy by our forefathers, and many before us, passing the same course, had appointed beforehand for us these troublesome ways by which we were compelled to pass, multiplying labor and sorrow upon the sons of Adam. But we found, O Lord, men praying to Thee, and we learned from them to conceive of Thee, according to our ability, to be some great one, who was able, though not visible to our senses, to hear and help us. For as a boy I began to pray to Thee, my help and my refuge, and in invoking Thee broke the bands of my tongue, and entreated Thee though little, with no little earnestness, that I might not be beaten at school. And when thou heard edst me not, giving me not over to folly thereby, my elders, yea, and my own parents too, who wished me no ill, laughed at my stripes, my then great and grievous ill. 15. Is there any one, Lord, with so high a spirit, cleaving to thee with so strong an affection? For even a kind of obtuseness may do that much, but is there, I say, any one who, by cleaving devoutly to thee, is endowed with so great a courage that he can esteem lightly those racks and hooks, and varied tortures of the same sort, against which, throughout the whole world, men supplicate thee with great fear, deriding those who most bitterly fear them, just as our parents derided the torments with which our masters punished us when we were boys. For we were no less afraid of our pains, nor did we pray less to thee to avoid them, and yet we sinned, in writing, or reading, or reflecting upon our lessons less than was required of us. For we wanted not, O Lord, memory or capacity, of which, by thy will, we possessed enough for our age, but we delighted only in play, and we were punished for this by those who were doing the same things themselves. But the idleness of our elders they call business, whilst boys who do the like are punished by those same elders, and yet neither boys nor men find any pity. For will any one of good sense approve of my being whipped because, as a boy, I played ball, and so was hindered from learning quickly those lessons by means of which, as a man, I should play more unbecomingly? And did he by whom I was beaten do other than this, who, when he was overcome in any little controversy with a co-tutor, was more tormented by anger and envy than I when beaten by a playfellow in a match at ball? Chapter 10. Through a love of ball playing and shows, he neglects his studies and the injunctions of his parents. 16. And yet I erred, O Lord God, the creator and disposer of all things in nature, but of sin the disposer only, I erred, O Lord my God, in doing contrary to the wishes of my parents and of those masters, for this learning which they, no matter for what motive, wished me to acquire, I might have put to good account afterwards. For I disobeyed them not because I had chosen a better way, but from a fondness for play, loving the honor of victory in the matches, and to have my ears tickled with lying fables, in order that they might itch the more furiously, the same curiosity beaming more and more in my eyes for the shows and sports of my elders. Yet those who give these entertainments are held in such high repute, that almost all desire the same for their children, whom they are still willing should be beaten, if so be these same games keep them from the studies by which they desire them to arrive at being the givers of them. 
Look down upon these things, O Lord, with compassion, and deliver us who now call upon Thee. Deliver those also who do not call upon Thee, that they may call upon Thee, and that Thou mayest deliver them. Chapter 11. Seized by disease, his mother being troubled, he earnestly demands baptism, which on recovery is postponed, his father not as yet believing in Christ. 17. Even as a boy I had heard of eternal life promised to us through the humility of the Lord our God condescending to our pride, and I was signed with the sign of the cross, and was seasoned with his salt even from the womb of my mother, who greatly trusted in thee. Thou S.A. West, O Lord, how at one time, while yet a boy, being suddenly seized with pains in the stomach, and being at the point of death, thou S.A. West, O my God, for even then thou wast my keeper, with what emotion of mind and with what faith I solicited from the piety of my mother, and of thy church, the mother of us all, the baptism of thy Christ, my Lord and my God, on which, the mother of my flesh being much troubled, since she, with a heart pure in thy faith, travailed in birth more lovingly for my eternal salvation, would, had I not quickly recovered, have without delay provided for my initiation and washing by thy life giving sacraments, confessing thee, O Lord Jesus, for the remission of sins. So my cleansing was deferred, as if I must needs, should I live, be further polluted, because, indeed, the guilt contracted by sin would, after baptism, be greater and more perilous. Thus I at that time believed with my mother and the whole house, except my father, yet he did not overcome the influence of my mother's piety in me so as to prevent my believing in Christ, as he had not yet believed in him. For she was desirous that thou, O my God, shouldst be my father rather than he, and in this thou didst aid her to overcome her husband, to whom, though the better of the two, she yielded obedience, because in this she yielded obedience to thee, who dost so command. 18. I beseech thee, my God, I would gladly know, if it be thy will, to what end my baptism was then deferred. Was it for my good that the reins were slackened, as it were, upon me for me to sin? Or were they not slackened? If not, whence comes it that it is still dinned into our ears on all sides? Let him alone, let him act as he likes, for he is not yet baptized. But as regards bodily health, no one exclaims, let him be more seriously wounded, for he is not yet cured. How much better, then, had it been for me to have been cured at once, and then, by my own and my friend's diligence, my soul's restored health had been kept safe in thy keeping, who gavest it? Better, in truth. But how numerous and great waves of temptation appeared to hang over me after my childhood! These were foreseen by my mother, and she preferred that the unformed clay should be exposed to them rather than the image itself. Chapter 12. Being compelled, he gave his attention to learning, but fully acknowledges that this was the work of God. 19. But in this my childhood, which was far less dreaded for me than youth, I had no love of learning, and hated to be forced to it, yet was I forced to it notwithstanding, and this was well done towards me, but I did not well, for I would not have learned had I not been compelled. For no man doth well against his will, even if that which he doth be well. Neither did they who forced me do well, but the good that was done to me came from thee, my God. For they considered not in what way I should employ what they forced me to learn, unless to satisfy the inordinate desires of a rich beggary and a shameful glory. But thou, by whom the very hairs of our heads are numbered, didst use for my good the error of all who pressed me to learn, and my own error in willing not to learn, didst thou make use of for my punishment, of which I, being so small a boy and so great a sinner, was not unworthy. Thus by the instrumentality of those who did not well didst thou well for me, and by my own sin didst thou justly punish me. For it is even as thou hast appointed, that every inordinate affection should bring its own punishment. Chapter 13. He delighted in Latin studies and the empty fables of the poets, but hated the elements of literature and the Greek language. 20. 
but what was the cause of my dislike of Greek literature, which I studied from my boyhood, I cannot even now understand. For the Latin I loved exceedingly, not what our first masters, but what the grammarians teach, for those primary lessons of reading, writing, and ciphering, I considered no less of a burden and a punishment than Greek. Yet whence was this and less from the sin and vanity of this life? For I was but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. For those primary lessons were better, assuredly, because more certain, seeing that by their agency I acquired, and still retain, the power of reading what I find written, and writing myself what I will, whilst in the others I was compelled to learn about the wanderings of a certain Aeneas, oblivious of my own, and to weep for Dido dead, because she slew herself for love, while at the same time I brooked with dry eyes my wretched self dying far from thee, in the midst of those things, O God, my life. 21. For what can be more wretched than the wretch who pities not himself shedding tears over the death of Dido for love of Aeneas, but shedding no tears over his own death in not loving thee, O God, light of my heart, and bread of the inner mouth of my soul, and the power that wettest my mind with my innermost thoughts? I did not love thee, and committed fornication against thee, and those around me thus sinning cried, Well done! Well done! For the friendship of this world is fornication against thee, and, well done, well done, is cried until one feels ashamed not to be such a man. And for this I shed no tears, though I wept for Dido, who sought death at the sword's point, myself the while seeking the lowest of thy creatures, having forsaken thee, earth tending to the earth, and if forbidden to read these things, how grieved would I feel that I was not permitted to read what grieved me. This sort of madness is considered a more honorable and more fruitful learning than that by which I learned to read and write. 22. But now, O my God, cry unto my soul, and let thy truth say unto me, It is not so, it is not so, better much was that first teaching. For behold, I would rather forget the wanderings of Aeneas, and all such things, than how to write and read. But it is true that over the entrance of the grammar school there hangs a veil, but this is not so much a sign of the majesty of the mystery, as of a covering for error. Let not them exclaim against me of whom I am no longer in fear, whilst I confess to thee, my God, that which my soul desires, and acquiesce in reprehending my evil ways, that I may love thy good ways. Neither let those cry out against me who buy or sell grammar learning. For if I ask them whether it be true, as the poet says, that Aeneas once came to Carthage, the unlearned will reply that they do not know, the learned will deny it to be true. But if I ask with what letters the name Aeneas is written, all who have learnt this will answer truly, in accordance with the conventional understanding men have arrived at as to these signs. Again, if I should ask which, if forgotten, would cause the greatest inconvenience in our life, reading and writing, or these poetical fictions, who does not see what every one would answer who had not entirely forgotten himself? I erred, then, when as a boy I preferred those vain studies to those more profitable ones, or rather loved the one and hated the other. One and one are two, two and two are four, this was then in truth a hateful song to me. While the wooden horse full of armed men, and the burning of Troy, and the spectral image of Crusa were a most pleasant spectacle of vanity. Chapter 14. Why he despised Greek literature, and easily learned Latin. 23. But why, then, did I dislike Greek learning which was full of like tales? For Homer also was skilled in inventing similar stories, and as most sweetly vain, yet was he disagreeable to me as a boy. I believe Virgil, indeed, would be the same to Grecian children, if compelled to learn him, as I was Homer. The difficulty, in truth, the difficulty of learning a foreign language mingled as it were with Gaul all the sweetness of those fabulous Grecian stories. For not a single word of it did I understand, and to make me do so, they vehemently urged me with cruel threatenings and punishments. There was a time also when, as an infant, I knew no Latin. But this I acquired without any fear or tormenting, 
by merely taking notice, amid the blandishments of my nurses, the jests of those who smiled on me, and the sportiveness of those who toyed with me. I learned all this, indeed, without being urged by any pressure of punishment, for my own heart urged me to bring forth its own conceptions, which I could not do unless by learning words, not of those who taught me, but of those who talked to me, into whose ears, also, I brought forth whatever I discerned. From this it is sufficiently clear that a free curiosity hath more influence in our learning these things than a necessity full of fear. But this last restrains the overflowings of that freedom, through thy laws, O God, thy laws, from the ferule of the schoolmaster to the trials of the martyr, being effective to mingle for us a salutary bitter, calling us back to thyself from the pernicious delights which allure us from thee. Chapter 15. He entreats God, that whatever useful things he learned as a boy may be dedicated to him. 24. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let not my soul faint under thy discipline, nor let me faint in confessing unto thee thy mercies, whereby thou hast saved me from all my most mischievous ways, that thou mightest become sweet to me beyond all the seductions which I used to follow, and that I may love thee entirely, and grasp thy hand with my whole heart, and that thou mayest deliver me from every temptation, even unto the end. For lo, O Lord, my King and my God, for thy service be whatever useful thing I learned as a boy, for thy service what I speak, and write, and count. For when I learned vain things, thou didst grant me thy discipline, and my sin in taking delight in those vanities, thou hast forgiven me. I learned, indeed, in them many useful words, but these may be learned in things not vain, and that is the safe way for yous to walk in. Chapter 16. He disapproves of the mode of educating youth, and he points out why wickedness is attributed to the gods by the poets. 25. But woe unto thee, thou stream of human custom! Who shall stay thy course? How long shall it be before thou art dried up? How long wilt thou carry down the sons of Eve into that huge and formidable ocean, which even they who are embarked on the cross, lignum, can scarce pass over? Do I not read in thee of Jove the thunderer and adulterer? And the two verily he could not be, but it was that, while the fictitious thunder served as a cloak, he might have warrant to imitate real adultery. Yet which of our gowned masters can lend a temperate ear to a man of his school who cries out and says, These were Homer's fictions, he transfers things human to the gods. I could have wished him to transfer divine things to us. But it would have been more true had he said, These are, indeed, his fictions, but he attributed divine attributes to sinful men, that crimes might not be accounted crimes, and that whosoever committed any might appear to imitate the celestial gods and not abandoned men. 26. And yet, thou stream of hell, into thee are cast the sons of men, with rewards for learning these things, and much is made of it when this is going on in the forum in the sight of laws which grant a salary over and above the rewards. And thou beatest against thy rocks and roarest, saying, Hence words are learnt, hence eloquence is to be attained, most necessary to persuade people to your way of thinking, and to unfold your opinions. So, in truth, we should never have understood these words, golden shower, bosom, intrigue, highest heavens, and other words written in the same place, unless Terence had introduced a good-for-nothing youth upon the stage, setting up Jove as his example of lewdness. Viewing a picture, where the tale was drawn, of Jove's descending in a golden shower, to Danae's bosom, dot, dot, with a woman to intrigue, and see how he excites himself to lust, as if by celestial authority, when he says, Great Jove, who shakes the highest heavens with his thunder, and I, poor mortal man, not do the same. I did it, and with all my heart I did it. Not one whit more easily are the words learned for this vileness, but by their means is the vileness perpetrated with more confidence. I do not blame the words, they being, as it were, choice and precious vessels, but the wine of error which was drunk in them to us by inebriated teachers, 
and unless we drank, we were beaten, without liberty of appeal to any sober judge. And yet, O oh my God, in whose presence I can now with security recall this, did I, unhappy one, learn these things willingly, and with delight, and for this was I called a boy of good promise. Chapter 17. He continues on the unhappy method of training youth in literary subjects. 27. Bear with me, my God, while I speak a little of those talents thou hast bestowed upon me, and on what follies I wasted them. For a lesson sufficiently disquieting to my soul was given me, in hope of praise, and fear of shame or stripes, to speak the words of Juno, as she raged and sorrowed that she could not. Latium bar. From all approaches of the Dardan king. Which I had heard Juno never uttered. Yet were we compelled to stray in the footsteps of these poetic fictions, and to turn that into prose which the poet had said in verse. And his speaking was most applauded in whom, according to the reputation of the persons delineated, the passions of anger and sorrow were most strikingly reproduced, and clothed in the most suitable language. But what is it to me, O oh my true life, my God, that my declaiming was applauded above that of many who were my contemporaries and fellow students? Behold, is not all this smoke and wind? Was there nothing else, too, on which I could exercise my wit and tongue? Thy praise, Lord, thy praises might have supported the tendrils of my heart by thy scriptures. So had it not been dragged away by these empty trifles, a shameful prey of the fowls of the air. For there is more than one way in which men sacrifice to the fallen angels. Chapter 18. Men desire to observe the rules of learning but neglect the eternal rules of everlasting safety. 28. But what matter of surprise is it that I was thus carried towards vanity, and went forth from thee, O my God, when men were proposed to me to imitate, who, should they in relating any acts of theirs, not in themselves evil, be guilty of a barbarism or solecism, when censured for it became confounded, but when they made a full and ornate oration, in well-chosen words, concerning their own licentiousness, and were applauded for it, they boasted. Thou seest this, O Lord, and keepest silence, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth, as thou art. Wilt thou keep silence forever? And even now thou drawest out of this vast deep the soul that seeketh thee and thirsteth after thy delights, whose heart said unto thee, I have sought thy face, thy face, Lord, will I seek. For I was far from thy face, through my darkened affections. For it is not by our feet, nor by change of place, that we either turn from thee or return to thee. Or, indeed, did that younger son look out for horses, or chariots, or ships, or fly away with visible wings, or journey by the motion of his limbs, that he might, in a far country, prodigally waste all that thou gavest him when he set out? A kind father when thou gavest, and kinder still when he returned destitute. So, then, in wanton, that is to say, in darkened affections, lies distance from thy face. 29. Behold, O Lord God, and behold patiently, as thou art wont to do, how diligently the sons of men observe the conventional rules of letters and syllables, received from those who spoke prior to them, and yet neglect the eternal rules of everlasting salvation received from thee, insomuch that he who practices or teaches the hereditary rules of pronunciation, if, contrary to grammatical usage, he should say, without aspirating the first letter, a human being, will offend men more than if, in opposition to thy commandments, he, a human being, were to hate a human being. As if, indeed, any man should feel that an enemy could be more destructive to him than that hatred with which he is excited against him, or that he could destroy more utterly him whom he persecutes than he destroys his own soul by his enmity. And of a truth, there is no science of letters more innate than the writing of conscience, that he is doing unto another what he himself would not suffer. How mysterious art thou, who in silence, dwellest on high, thou God, the only great, who by an unwearied law dealest out the punishment of blindness to illicit desires. 
when a man seeking for the reputation of eloquence stands before a human judge while a thronging multitude surrounds him, inveighs against his enemy with the most fierce hatred, he takes most vigilant heed that his tongue slips not into grammatical error, but takes no heed lest through the fury of his spirit he cut off a man from his fellow men. 30. These were the customs in the midst of which I, unhappy boy, was cast, and on that arena it was that I was more fearful of perpetrating a barbarism than, having done so, of envying those who had not. These things I declare and confess unto thee, my God, for which I was applauded by them whom I then thought it my whole duty to please, for I did not perceive the gulf of infamy wherein I was cast away from thine eyes. For in thine eyes what was more infamous than I was already, displeasing even those like myself, deceiving with innumerable lies both tutor, and masters, and parents, from love of play, a desire to see frivolous spectacles, and a stage struck restlessness, to imitate them, pilferings I committed from my parents' cellar and table, either enslaved by gluttony, or that I might have something to give to boys who sold me their play, who, though they sold it, liked it as well as I. In this play, likewise, I often sought dishonest victories, I myself being conquered by the vain desire of preeminence. And what could I so little endure, or, if I detected it, censured I so violently, as the very things I did to others, and, when myself detected I was censured, preferred rather to quarrel than to yield. Is this the innocence of childhood? Nay, Lord, nay, Lord, I entreat thy mercy, O my God. For these same sins, as we grow older, are transferred from governors and masters, from nuts, and balls, and sparrows, to magistrates and kings, to gold, and lands, and slaves, just as the rod is succeeded by more severe chastisements. It was, then, the stature of childhood that thou, O our king, didst approve of as an emblem of humility when thou sightest, of such is the kingdom of heaven. 31. But yet, O Lord, to thee, most excellent and most good, thou architect and governor of the universe, thanks had been due unto thee, our God, even hadst thou willed that I should not survive my boyhood. For I existed even then, I lived, and felt, and was solicitous about my own well-being, a trace of that most mysterious unity from whence I had my being. I kept watch by my inner sense over the wholeness of my senses, and in these insignificant pursuits, and also in my thoughts on things insignificant, I learned to take pleasure in truth. I was averse to being deceived, I had a vigorous memory, was provided with the power of speech, was softened by friendship, shunned sorrow, meanness, ignorance. In such a being what was not wonderful and praiseworthy. But all these are gifts of my God. I did not give them to myself, and they are good, and all these constitute myself. Good, then, is he that made me, and he is my God, and before him will I rejoice exceedingly for every good gift which, as a boy, I had. For in this lay my sin, that not in him, but in his creatures, myself and the rest, I sought for pleasures, honors, and truths, falling thereby into sorrows, troubles, and errors. Thanks be to thee, my joy, my pride, my confidence, my God, thanks be to thee for thy gifts, but preserve thou them to me. For thus wilt thou preserve me, and those things which thou hast given me shall be developed and perfected, and I myself shall be with thee, for from thee is my being. Karaoke Books <laughs>